Matthew 13, when I verse, start at verse, uh, I'm going I'm to read a couple of verses, then get to the, uh, um, uh, a little to our text. In Matthew 13 and verse 10, his disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, It is because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to know them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him it shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, to him shall be taken away, even that which he hath. I want to understand something. Uh, <laughs> the biblical principle here is it's real important is, um, God says, they ask, why are you speaking in parables? He says, because everybody is not going to get it, and I, and I want certain people to get it. And he says, well, well who's going to get it? He says, the ones who have. And it's a strange thing, a principle that God has. He says this also in Daniel. He says he gives wisdom to the wise. He gives wisdom to the wise. Why, why would you give wisdom to wise people? And why was this verse here? Uh, it says, for whosoever hath, whoever has will be given, it shall be given to him, and he shall have more in abundance. And whosoever has not, from whom shall be taken away even that he hath. That is totally a, a, a misunderstood concept and, and, and a strange concept, especially the way Americans think right now. <clears throat> it's a strange concept, but understand, God is a God that decides why did wise investments. Okay? He gives wisdom to the wise. Why? He gives them some wisdom, and they're wise and made good decisions. So God says, okay, you have made good decisions with, with, with the wisdom and knowledge you've had. Let me give you more knowledge. Let me give you more wisdom because you have been wise of that. That's the way God works. It's spiritual capitalism. Okay? God says, if, and this person, this person is so messed up. They make all these bad choices. They need to learn. They haven't made good choices with the knowledge they had. They don't need more knowledge. They need to do what they already know to do. It's like somebody saying, this company is losing money, losing money. I really need to invest in it because they need my money. That's exactly what most people expect God to do. To give them wisdom, I want to be the wisest person. You don't use the wisdom you have. Why should God give you more wisdom? You don't impart wisdom to other people. And, and God needs to give you more money, but you don't use the money you have wisely. Why would God give you more money? He is not faithful in the least, not maybe faithful in much. And God said, you know what? They're going to listen anyway, so I'm going to hide the truth in them. They're not going to get it at all. I'm going to speak in parables so they won't get it at all. They don't deserve the truth. Jesus says, I will not cast my pearl before swine. My truth's too good to give to them. They, will, they reject it anyway. I'm going to make it in parables so only the people who are really paying attention and already listening and doing what's right, they will have learned enough to, cons to, to perceive what I'm really saying. A lot of people will miss out on it. They won't get it. So that's the spiritual, the way that God works in those things. And he's teaching them in parables. Verse 17, it says this. It says, Verbele, uh, I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Uh, by the way, I... I when I ever get in that subject of faithful and least, it's, it's tough for me to get off it because it, I just, it breaks my heart so often dealing with people. People come, can I just tell you, in counseling nowadays, 60% of the counseling you do is people want a magic pill. And, you'll get, and, and so just the heads up with counseling with me when you come to me, I'm going to give you something to do, Okay. And if you don't do what I give you to do, when you come back for a second appointment, I will ask you, did you do this? And you will say, if you say, no, it's too busy, I didn't have time, I'll say, okay, well, our, our, our appointment's done, and when you're done with that, go ahead and set up an appointment and we'll meet. Because I don't want to go and spend investment and time and give you wisdom when you're not going to do it. Because most people just want you to say, hey, if you'll do this, here's a solution. Take this little pill, do this little thing, and all your problems go away. And, and you want to say, here's how you rebuild your marriage. No, no, I just want, my, I just want to stop fighting. <laughs> no. Look, we need to rebuild here. You need to take some steps. You do not microwave yourself out of what you crockpotted yourself into. It's going to take some work, some time. And you've got to make choices. 
And I don't want to invest in someone who's not going to do what I say. Because you know what you need to do. The Bible says wisdom in the heart of man is like a deep well, and a man of understanding will draw it out. Most people know what they need to do. You just don't do it. And a good counselor doesn't give you some fantastic new thing you never heard before. They bring out what you already know you should have been doing and saying, all right, you got to do this. Right? You know the solution to your problem, right? It's just not easy. And that's why God is very careful how he invests in people. And that's why we as a church, and that's why you see the Philippines, we're very careful who we invest in. Our pastor knows that. He said, look, if they won't work, don't invest, they don't get anything. Find the people who are faithful, who are doing the things they should do, people who are going to work, and the people who are trying to work. And, and, and that's the way we invest in everything. That's, that's the way we run everything in the ministry here. Not faithful in least, not made faithful in much. That's, that's the way things work. Um, you, you want a ministry? Start doing something with nothing. See, every, in the ministry nowadays, everybody wants a position. They don't want a ministry. <laughs> who cares about position? Just go do what you're supposed to do. I gotta stop. I gotta, that's not the message. Um, the message is titled uh, "When You Have Found It." When you have found it, and uh, but I wanted to understand that God was carefully giving wisdom to those who deserved it. He gives uh, wisdom about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we read verse 17, I think. The kingdom of heaven is what Jesus is talking about here. Verse one, um, or uh, <clears throat> verse. Uh, uh, let's see, verse 11. Uh, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries, of the kingdom of heaven. Verse uh, 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in a field. Verse 31, uh, 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 we see again, uh, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed. And uh, verse 33, uh, another parable speak unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. And so he's teaching us about the kingdom of heaven and what it's like and how it really works. And he's doing it in parables. This whole Matthew 13 is that. All the way from starting off with the parable of the sower and uh, all the way to the parable of, uh, of the uh, householder in verse 51 and 52. It's parable after parable after parable. And I want to read and uh, start in verse 43 now. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun, uh, in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which uh, when a man hath found, it, he ha found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for the chance to teach the Word of God. What a privilege that uh, no man deserves. We pray your spirit would move mightily in the service today. We pray each person. Thank you for the full church and, and a good crowd. Lord, it's a good thing to serve you if we're empty, if just you and, uh, and uh, two of us, Lord. But we thank you for every person that's here because that's more chance to influence the Word of God. And Lord, we pray not that I would just speak and fill a time, but your spirit would speak and change lives and speak to us in a great way. We need your help today, and we pray for a mighty working in this service. Just bless and give me the words and the thoughts and, and speak to hearts individually above and beyond anything I would say, Lord. We need you to just walk in the midst and be in the middle of us and change our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I grew up in the world, as you know, and I was uh, I, I, I started going to church a little bit and wasn't very faithful. and but went here and there, just a baby, baby Christian, and, uh, and, and just trying to figure it all out in, in a whole new world. And, uh, and uh, my life had been raising the world, doing what the world does, and living the world's way, doing with a public school kid with, uh, without uh, strict parents and running around free in the world does, just running around in trouble and partying and mischievous and just doing the stuff the world does and, and having some fun in the world because uh, the pleasure of sin does last for a season. And, uh, and, and that's what I was doing. And, and as I, I began to learn the Bible, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God began to give me a hunger for the Bible. And I started uh, going uh, to my neighbor's house and asking them to study the Bible with me. And they were kind of stunned that I want to learn the Bible so bad, as I was pretty stunned. I don't know why I had this hunger. It was just like I, was, I wanted the Bible. And that was, of course, a newborn babe desiring the sincere milk of the Word, as the Bible says, 2 Peter 2.2. 2. And, uh, and then we went to a camp. 
and uh, a lot of strange things about that. <clears throat> I used to, uh, I used to, um, <laughs> this is a crazy thing, I don't know if I ever told this story, I used to get these feelings, and these feelings were incredibly accurate, and I would feel like this is gonna, something bad's going to happen, and, and it would be so accurate that me and my friends, I mean just a bunch of unsaved, rowdy kids, teenagers, do we base our plans on my feelings? I would say, I feel like something bad's going to happen. It, when we didn't do that, bad things happened. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I mean, bad, I mean, sometimes friends died on these things. It was, it was incredibly accurate. Sometimes I get these bad feelings. Uh, we would have injuries. It just, it's all kinds of strange things. I came to find out later, I believe those are totally demonic. Because I, we, we scheduled to go to a Christian camp, and boy, me going to a Christian camp was crazy. And I got the worst feelings I ever got in my life. And I told my friends, my buddies, that I said, man, I got the worst feeling. I can't get over This is the worst feelings I've ever had in my life. It won't stop. And they said, you shouldn't go. You're going to die at camp. You're going to die if that happens. And they told me, you shouldn't go. You shouldn't go. And, 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 and you know, the occult has power. And I, 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 uh, I, I just, I, don't, I couldn't tell you why I went, but I went to camp. At that camp, at that camp, God just showed up and, and God just came to me. And I'll never forget, uh, one night after campfire, boy, God just came down and, and just was there and talking to me and said, you, you need me. And, and I wasn't sure if I say before then, I kind of, I, I kind of understood it, I kind of didn't. I had my, a lot of doubts to understand it. But after that campfire, I went out away from the campfire and went out into the woods a little bit. And I just, I just prayed right there. And I, I said, Lord, I want to be saved. I want you. And this is, this is great. And I really want you. And, uh, and at that point, I knew I was 100% saved and accepted Christ as my Savior. And, and, uh, and then the next day, there was a banquet, and everybody's supposed to go to the banquet and, and get a date. And the, tr- this is, the truth was, is these are Christian kids at camp, and I was so different. I was a worldly kid, and I was, I was there at camp wearing my Scorpions heavy metal shirt. And uh, I was so different from everybody else. I didn't even know how to act around Christian girls. And I, I, could, I was too embarrassed to go to the banquet. And so I skipped the banquet. I was good at that because I always skipped school anyway. And uh, I went up on the beach. It's Camp Wyneema in Oregon down by Lincoln City. And, and uh, I went down to the beach. And, but God had been moving in my heart. And, and, I really, and I was feeling the presence of God in my life for the first time and, and, uh, and, and learning. And I, it was so obvious to me how superior the way of God was. It was so far above the way of the world. Like, I'd already experienced the world and saw what the world has to offer, and it's got some fun, and, you know, it's the, this and that, and it's some entertainment, and, 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 you know, it's fun to go party and get drunk, and the girls, and this and that, and it's all, and I experienced all that. But when I all of a sudden saw what the presence of God was like, and living for God was like, I'm telling you, I, it, it was... Such an obvious choice. It was like I had stale, crusty, moldy bread on one side. And I had a steak dinner on the other side with seven course. I mean, it was like, and and I remember praying this, and I went up up on 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 a big uh, sand dune. And I've told the story before, but I went up on the sand dune, and I said, I just cried. I was crying. I said, Lord, this way is so much better. And the thing that I feel right now, and I felt with your presence, and the way of life is so incredible, Lord. If I knew you were real, because I had doubts, and I had the world in my mind, I had all this stuff. I said, if I knew you were real, I would serve you and never go back. And I prayed that that day. And I've told this story before, and and if you know me, I'm the most sober, level-headed guy you'll ever meet in your life. Everybody knows that about me. I am not unstable in the least bit. I don't imagine things. Um, everybody knows me, knows how stable I am. Uh, and you can talk to my unsafe family. They'll tell you the same thing. He's extremely stable. Um, I, I opened my eyes, and the glory of God was everywhere. And I can't explain it. I'll never explain it. But literally, every plant was glowing with a, a non-earthly glow. The sun, the sunset was glowing. The ocean was glowing. All of creation was glowing with a supernatural glow I've never seen before. And God just said, yep, I'm here. And I just started weeping. I just bowed my head and I said, Lord, you're real. This is real. This is so good. This is so great. I'm going to do this the rest of my life. I opened my eyes, looked back around. It wasn't glowing anymore. I said, why did that 
close my eyes. And uh, I would have kept them open forever. I still have them open. And, uh, but, uh, but I saw what a superior way to live. I mean, a j life of joy, a life of peace, a life of knowing God's got a plan for you, a life of the presence of God in your life, in his presence is fullness of joy, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore, uh, purpose in life, doing things for God, helping people, uh, the joy of the Lord being your strength, knowing real love, not the world's fake love, phony love. Once I realized it was real, and by the way, that was 33 years ago. I've never looked back. Not for a day, not for a week, not for a month. I've never looked back. I don't want the world. I don't wish I would do anything else. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade places with, with Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates. No way. I wouldn't trade places with anybody to do the will of God and to find God's plan for my life and to serve the Lord, it is so far superior to find what God's made you for and do that. Yeah. It is so superior. And I said, if this is real, I will do this the rest of my life. God said, it's real. And, and of course, faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God and all those things. And God uh, 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 worked in many other ways. Once you find the way of God, you give up anything to have it. When I started serving God, understand, it wasn't long after that that I was walking through a park and I said, Lord, what do I want to do with my life? And he says, be a preacher. I said, what? He said, be a preacher. Be a preacher. I just kept hearing in my mind, be a preacher. Be a preacher. And me, being my typical reckless self, said, okay. That was the end of it. Never looked back yet. Some of you are saying, I think you missed the calling. And, uh, but, but I, that was it. Well, then when God called me a preacher, my whole life plans changed. That changed. Now I'm God's. What if God wants me to go live in Zimbabwe? What if God wants me to go live in Uruguay? Or Chad? Or Russia? It's not my life anymore. I gave him a whole life. Wherever he wants to move me, he can move me. Who I married changed. Now it wasn't who I wanted to marry. It's God's plan for my life. Okay? And God loved my wife so much. And uh, you'll get that slowly. And, uh, but but it, was, it was God's plan. I'm in Seattle not because I chose to come to Seattle. I like Seattle. It's fine. But, but God called me here. God called me here. Well, I lost my life. My plans, my dreams, my desires, what I was going to live for. No longer was I going to live for money or this or that or whatever the world lives for. I now was living for God. My life was not my own. I was bought with a price. Everything changed. But I didn't lose. Because I found something worth having forever. And that's on earth, let alone in a trillion years. I'll still be, if I just stay faithful to God, I will still be sitting there with the treasures and the mansions and the rewards of serving God as compared to what, what, what would I take with me into my grave? A nice suit. <laughs> that's about it. What else are you going to put in there? You don't see U-Hauls following hearses. Okay, because you don't take it with you. What, when you find the kingdom of God, it's worth everything and losing everything. And that's what God talks about here. Paul found this. So keep your finger there in, in Matthew, but Philippians. When you find the kingdom of God, nothing else matters. That's all you want is to do the will of God, to serve the Lord to do his plan for your life. And it, it, you might lose a bunch, but you don't really lose anything. You invest a buck, you get back a thousand. It's, it's not, you don't say you lost a dollar when you got so much back. 
Because there's something about being in the kingdom of God and serving God that's amazing. Paul talks about his credentials and his upbringing, his education, and all the things. He had the right family. He had the right connections. He had the right citizenship. He had the right education. He had the right training. Everything he needed <coughs> to have a successful life in the Jewish world that he lived in. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, I, I had all those things. Verse 4, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any man uh, think that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. I had all kinds of stuff going for me. I was the right tribe, the right nation. Uh, I had all the things going for me. But verse 7, he said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is, of, which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. He says, I lost everything. He said that. I, I suffered the loss of all things. He lost his family. He lost his clothes. He lost his health. He lost his friends. He said, I suffered the loss of everything for Christ. And he says, oh, no, are you regretting it? No, I count it but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him and know the power of his resurrection. When you get close to Jesus Christ, everything else gets kind of dim and unimportant. When you serve God, when you start serving the cause of Christ, when you get the power of God in your life and know the power of his resurrection and the power of Jesus Christ in your life, Everything in the world, it seemed like it was so, such a big deal. Look, how many times are you going to go into the things of this world and try them? And they're fun for a little while, then got to do it again. Got to do it again. Got to do more of it. Like, it's empty. He says, I just want a Christ. I just want a Christ. Then he goes it back in Matthew 23. We find, it, we find he goes into a couple parables. And they're very short parables. A man was, uh, was uh, a, a small businessman, and he had a little shop, and, and he would, uh, he would, in Matthew 13, and he would go, and, and he would travel, and he had a, a, a little uh, cart. He didn't have a big business. just a small business, and he sold things and sold trinkets, and he bought things and sold them, and, and he was uh, going along with his little hand cart and going to go uh, down to uh, another part of town to, to go to the people who made the materials, and he would, he would go buy those little things, and he would, he would uh, get his things. It took him, uh, uh, he would do it uh, only once or twice a week because it was a long way to go, and and he had a shop, and he had a house behind his shop where he lived, and it was, it was pretty nice, a little shop, a little house, and, and he lived okay, and he was a small businessman. And uh, one day he was taking his cart down there to go buy his stuff, and, and, uh, and, uh, and as he gets toward, he gets, he, he's, he's going, cutting, he's cutting across, he's, he's tired, he wants to go faster, and he starts cutting across the field instead of taking the roads, and, and, uh, and there's just kind of an old junky field of garbage, and, and nothing really grew there, it wasn't a very nice field, and, and as he, he goes along, he's kind of tired, he's bumpy, and so he goes and he puts his cart down and he sits down on his, uh, on his, uh, on his, on a little mound there, and he sits down and just kind of stretching out underneath a tree there, just an old tree, and he's kind of sitting there, and he, he's just kind of scraping the ground, and he scrapes the ground, and he sees a piece of, like some of the dirt falls off, and he sees a piece of wood there, like a sanded piece of wood. He kind of looks at that, and he starts digging away, and he he all of a sudden sees something shiny there. He picks it up, and it's a gold coin. And he starts digging and digging and looking, and all of a sudden he sees the top of a treasure chest, and he sees it kind of the top's broken open, and he sees it's full of gold and diamonds and jewelry. And he does what any smart person would do. Yep. <laughs> and he pushes the dirt back over it. And he covers it all up, puts the piece of grass back on it. He puts his foot over on the other side and scrapes, and nothing's there. And he reaches over the top of the mound over here, and he looks, and there's another smaller chest hiding there. And he digs underneath of it, and he looks, and there's more silver underneath this chest. He covers it all up, gets up and looks around, grabs his cart, 
carts it off and goes and buys his little stuff there and, and brings it back. And he's walking through the field and he's looking to see if anybody had seen him. And he goes back and he brings his stuff back to his store and he kind of closes the shop for the day and he goes... And, uh, and he walks over the neighborhood over there and, and where, that, where that field was. It's just a small, just, just not even the size of half of this room, just a small corner field, just people kind of threw the garbage there. Nobody really lived on or anything. And, and he went over to House Cross Street and he says, hey, who owns a junky field over there? And he says, oh, it's the old, the old Scrooge guy, the old, old, old Moshi. He's, you know, that guy, he owns that. He owns so much of property around here. And that just, it's not connected to the rest of his property, but it's on the corner there. And he figures somebody wanted it someday. And he says, oh, okay, where, where does he live at? And, and so he, he goes over and he walks up the hill and he goes to the nice house where the old crusty guy, Moshi, lives. And he says, hey, knocks on the door and the and, uh, guy answers the door and he says, hey, how you doing? And he says, uh, my name's Joshua. And he says, you know, I, I have a little business down there. And he says, you know that junky little field you have there, you know, on the corner there, right there on the corner of this street and that street, the one with the, with the, with the ugly old dead tree there and nothing grows in that field. And, and uh, you know, I've seen that field for a lot of years. He says, you know, that thing is probably just a pain to you. You want to sell that thing? And the old guy said, hmm, finally got my buyer for this. I knew someday somebody would want that spot, that corner spot. He says, yeah, I'll sell it to you. He says, how much? He says, $50,000. $50,000? That thing's been vacant for 40 years. There's just garbage on it. Nothing grows on it. Everybody knows there's no good soil on that property. He says, well, all right, fine. Don't buy it. 20,000. No, 50. 25. 50. All right, forget it. Never mind. All right, 45. 30. 45 or forget it, just leave. 42. Okay, 43,000. All right, 43,000. You got that much money? I'll get it. Close his door. What an idiot. I just sold it for $43,000. That thing's not worth 5,000. Yes. He walks away. What an idiot. I just bought that whole field. And I know what's in it. He goes back home. Honey, guess what? What, honey? You know this business we've been taking 15 years to get going? Yeah, it's going pretty good. It's growing a lot. Yep, we're getting rid of it. We're selling it. You are what? What's wrong with you? Honey, the words, women, please. These words are so meaningful. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. And the woman says, <coughs> Trust me, honey. He goes out. He sells us. He puts his business up for sale, all his stuff in his shop. He puts his house up for sale. Boy, his friend's like, what are you doing? You, you have a nice house. You have a nice business. It makes good money. I think that, that, you shouldn't sell that thing. That, that's what's your security. You don't have anything. He says, look, I'm selling, I'm selling the cart too. He said, I'm selling all my animals. I have a mule back home. I have a small piece of property back by my parents' house. I'm selling that too. It's all for sale. And he goes on and he starts selling. And pretty soon, somebody says, I'll, I'll buy your house and your business. I'll buy it for $30,000. He says, no, I need more than that, $35,000. Okay, I'm not buying it. Okay, I need more than that. And he goes and he sells that property. His dad's like, son, why, don't sell your property. You know, that's your retirement place. And you don't want to sell that. You're going to go live there someday underneath the nice coconut trees. And, and it's a nice place to live. And don't sell that, son. I'm selling it. Dad, just trust me. I'm going to sell this thing. I got something better. I'm going to sell this thing. And he sells that for $10,000. And he finally gets a good offer on his business and the cart and his house and everything. And all his furniture has to stay. And he gets enough money together where after he tithes. Amen. How much did he pay? Was he going to pay? 40 what? 43. 43. You got a deal. He's got $43,000 and nothing. He almost had to sell a kid. And uh, he had no house. He had no cart. 
He had no retirement plan. He had nothing. He walks up to the man, takes his business lawyer with him, and comes up there and says, okay, here's $43,000. <laughs> you raised that much money, really, yeah. All right, signs the papers. Yes. He goes back. He waits till night. Says, honey, go stay with your mom and dad for a while. <laughs> he sneaks in there at night. He grabs some gold coins and buries them again. And he goes and takes those coins. And the next day, he buys a wagon with horses. Everybody's mocked him. Everybody thought he was crazy. Everybody thought, you lost your business for nothing. You, what, it's so hard to get a business and a house. And you have family. What are you doing? You're crazy. You lost everything. He brings that wagon. And he starts digging. And he starts loading the cart. His first shovel full is 10,000. And he loads it. And he loads it. And he loads it. And he's got two, three million dollars. And he says, I didn't lose anything in this deal. I can go buy back my old business for 50000 I can go buy dad's property and all the property around it. I didn't lose anything. I found a treasure in a field. And it was hidden. And the kingdom of God is hidden. I don't expect people out there all to understand why we live for God. But we have a treasure in a field. And it's hidden. And if you find that, you give up everything for that field. Because you don't lose when you give up for the kingdom of God. And then when you go and you say, uh, verse uh, 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. He's pretty well off, isn't he? King of heaven is like another guy. Another guy was a merchant also, and he lived by the ocean, and he had a small shop, and he sold pearls. Well, pearls aren't always hard to find. He had little dinky pearls and cracked pearls, and sometimes he had a nice white pearl that was small, and every, well, a couple times he even saved up enough pearls, and he made whole necklaces out of nice pearls, and then he bought some more pearls, and he built his business up better, and he got some people some money, started buying from him, and he, he got a, 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 a business going. It was going pretty good, and he had, he had a nice house there right pretty close to the ocean, and he had a nice business going. And he had his pearls, and, and uh, he, was, he was happy. He bought a boat so he could go find more pearls and, and find people who sold pearls. And, and one day this man goes, and uh, he's out there in his boat, and he says, you know, I've had the rich people tell me they want the best pearl. They'd rather have one fantastic pearl than, uh, that they could just show off than a whole necklace of nice little pearls. And so, you know, I'm going to try to find the perfect pearl and just find, find a really big pearl that I could sell to a, a king or a queen or, or some very rich person who really just wants to be gaudy and show off. Because they pay, percentage-wise, it takes a long time to find a lot of little pearls. Let me see if I can find me one really big one. And so he went out on some islands and he started saying, hey, where are the best pearls out here? Who's got the best pearls? And... <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and he just couldn't find anything, couldn't find anything. Then one day, as he continued to do that, he'd find pearls and, you know, decent-sized pearls and nice pearls. One day, he's out there asking, he said, hey, over on that little dinky island out there, it's pretty far out there, there's a guy out there. He is the best diver in the whole area. And he said he found a pearl of all pearls. Really? Okay, let's go out there. And he, he go, takes his boat out there to this little, I mean, little island. It's just a little dinky island. It's small. And this guy's on there, and, and he's got a bunch of dogs around. And he's pretty much him and just two or three other people uh, on the island uh, that live there. And, and he goes up, and the dogs are barking. And he walks up to the door, this, this little, little hut out there. And the man walks out and quiets the dogs. And he says, hey, how you doing? I'm so-and-so, a pearl buyer. He heard you've got a great pearl. He says, I found a pearl. He says, only I can dive, dive those depths. He said, it was the biggest, uh, 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 the biggest oyster I've ever seen. He says, I've got, I've got the pearl of all pearls. He says, but it's going to cost. And he expected to find a pearl the size of maybe a small marble or whatever. 
And the guy brings it out, and this pearl is this big. And it's perfect. The color's perfect. It's just glowing and perfect and beautiful. And the pearl seller looks at it and goes, I can have kings and queens compete over this pearl. I can sell this thing for $20 million. So how much you want for it? He says, I want to own this island. It's going to cost me $50,000 to own the island. He says, all right, don't sell it to anybody else. I'll be back. He goes back. He sells every pearl he owns. He sells his business. He sells his house. He sells his boat. He borrows a friend's boat and rows out there and hands him $50,000, comes back with the mother of all pearls. After that, he lived on a giant hillside overlooking the whole ocean. Massive house. No work. He retired. Never had a scavenger for pearls again. Why? He found the pearl at a great price and he sold everything to get it. The kingdom of God is just like that. We find out in this pearl of great price. When something's worth great value to you, you're willing to lose anything to get it, and the reward of getting it, especially the kingdom of God, is worth that. Let me say, God thought we were a pearl of great price and gave everything for us. He gave his life. He gave everything. This this parable goes both ways. You're a pearl of great price to Jesus. He gave everything for you. And then God says, hey, the kingdom of heaven is worth it. You might lose everything. You might lose your friends. Your family might mock you. You might lose some of your money. You might get called to go to the mission field, like Esther. You might have something God has planned for you that you never had planned before, and it's not part of your dreams. Let me tell you, you are selling all you have for God, but you are not losing out. You found the treasure in the field. The kingdom of God is greater, is more valuable than anything you will lose, but you have to lose what you have to get it. They sold all they had. Matthew 8, quickly, I gotta go and finish up. Matthew 8. <clears throat> Living for God has some sacrifices, but they're not really sacrifices, but they are hard for us short term. When we sell our house, we think it's better be worth it. When we sell, when, the, when, the, when, these, when these, these men, when these merchants sold these things, they had to believe that it was worth it, and it is. What does Jesus say? People want to follow him. In verse 18, Jesus saw the multitudes about him. He gave commandment uh, to depart to the other side. And a certain scribe came and said, and Master, I have followed thee whither, wherever thou goest. And he said, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. Another disciple said, Lord, let me go bury my father. He said, Follow me and let the bed, dead bury their dead. People said, Hey, I want to follow you, Jesus. He says, It's going to cost something. I'm homeless. Don't go back. It costs something to serve me. It costs something. We find in Matthew 16, he says it again. And he talks about the price of serving God. And it does cost you a price. There is some sacrifice in there. It's just a kingdom of God as a treasure that's worth it. And Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? See, you lose your life. That's your plans, your dreams, your desires for your life. And you give your life to God. And God says, okay, now you get my life for you, the kingdom of God. And he says, you know what? You've got to lose your life to get my life. You've got to lose your plans to get my plans. You've got to lose your dreams to get my dreams. But God's dreams and God's plans and God's will is so superior to anything you would have accomplished in your life. And the purpose and the joy and the victory and the power of the kingdom of God is a treasure in a field worth selling all you have to get. I did not know any of that doctrine. Knew none of what I just taught you there. I just knew this I felt the presence of God. I saw the way of God, just, just a glimpse of the will of God and what serving the Lord is like. And I looked at my old life in the world, and I said, Lord, if you are real, show me your will, and I will do this the rest of my life. 
Why? I found the pearl of great price. I found the treasure in the field. And you know why I lost my life, lost all my dreams? I'm having a blast. I'm loving it. I'm in McDonald's every day. Why? Because the kingdom of God is a pearl of great price. The will of God, the plan of God, the presence of God, the eternity with God is so worth it that you sell what you have. You give your life. You give what you have to God. He said, Lord, take my life. It's all yours. I give everything to you. I am yours. I lose my life. I lose my plans. I lose my dreams. I'm yours. But then you get the field of the treasure in it. And let me tell you, that is what the kingdom of God is. It is great. It is not, oh, and I can't stand to go to church and be like, oh, so hard out there. We got all done. What are you doing? You're at Disneyland sitting around going, oh, the ranch is so tall. Cotton can disappears quickly. Oh, what are you doing? You're serving the God of the universe. He came that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. It is not hang on. You've got the power of God. You can see great things. It's time to go forward to victory. It's a joyful life. It's a life of victory. It's the power of God. And churches are sitting around boring and miserable and bored church members looking at their phone during church and the preacher sitting there trying to figure out what to say. What is going on with you folks? This is the kingdom of God. It's exciting. It's great. It's victorious. It's mighty. Just, you got to buy it. <laughs> you got to buy it. But when you do, maybe you might think you're crazy at first, but it's pretty good afterward. Pretty good afterward. Yeah, it costs getting up and going to church on Sunday. Come back Sunday night. Go and be faithful to church. It takes prayer. It takes reading your Bible. It takes, it takes spending some time. It takes giving. It takes loving people who are unlovable. It takes persecution and people making fun of you. It takes some things. It costs some things. Yeah, it does. So do the field with the treasure in it. There's more treasure than you have. So let's realize the kingdom of God is worth it. When you have found it, when you have found it, be willing to lose everything to get it. That's what serving God is. That's the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that we would, we would buy the field. I pray we'd buy the pearl of great price. Lord, I pray that we'd understand that there is things that are worth it in serving you. And the kingdom of God is worth it. And I pray that you'd help us understand that this, Lord. And that some people today would say, I'll lose my life. I'll lose my plans. I'll lose my dreams. I'll serve God with my life. May some people, Lord, decide that the kingdom of God is a field of treasure. And it is a pearl of great price. It's worth selling all the dinky little pearls that we thought were so valuable. Lord, I pray today that you spoke to hearts, and I pray today we would do that. I pray today if someone doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, they would ask him to save, to save them, Lord, because, Lord, we know that it starts with salvation. And I pray today that they would accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior if they've not done that. And may all of us be living for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, our heads about our eyes are closed. I'm going to talk to you just for a second with our heads about our eyes closed and no one looking. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. The first step to the kingdom of God is accepting Jesus Christ as your way to heaven. He is the only way. He, the church can't save you, and I can't save you, and you can't save yourself. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. You're a sinner, and that sin has separated you and God. But Jesus came to die to wash away that sin. He was buried and rose again three days later. And if you will ask Jesus to save you and trust him as your way to heaven, he will take away your sin and give you a home in heaven. And that's the first step is letting the kingdom of God come inside of you by Jesus Christ coming to live in you when you accept him as Savior. That doesn't mean you turned over a new leaf or live a good life. It means you came to the Lord and said, I know I'm a sinner and I need Jesus to be my Savior. I trust him. If you've never done that, I want to give you a chance to accept Jesus Christ right now. I'm going to say a prayer, and the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not a magical prayer, but if you pray to God and ask him to save you and tell him you trust Jesus as your, as your way to heaven, he will save you. If you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, will you pray this right now to him? Just say it silently in your heart. He'll hear you. You don't need to pray it out loud, but if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior right now, He's waiting to wash away your sins. That's why he died. 
Just pray this silently to God. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I don't deserve heaven. But I believe Jesus died for me, was buried, and rose again. I right now ask Jesus to come in to my life and take away my sins. I trust him dying on the cross as my way to heaven and not what I can do. I believe he is the risen Lord. In Jesus' name.